So hello everyone. Hello to another, come, welcome to another community meeting. Uh, today we have Vitali who did his uh, PhD in uh, Sanger Institute. He finished in 2023 uh, under the supervision of Omer Bayraktar, uh, Oliver Stegel and Sarah Teichmann. And today you're talking, Tali, about uh, the published work during this uh, PhD, I guess, yeah, an ongoing work with about cell to location and in general about probabilistic modeling and what to expect from spatial analysis and more. So the floor is yours. And if you share your screens, I can give you the OK and you can start. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me. Um, yeah. Um, do you see my presenter mode screen, right? No, we see full screen, perfect. Uh, yeah, full screen, good. Um, yeah, so today I will talk to you about um, how we think about creating probabilistic models for resolving cell identity and tissue architecture, mostly about the tissue architecture part. Um, and so there will be some results about our um, the ongoing work, but um, mostly uh, let's discuss some kind of foundational principles of how to think about um, tissue architecture mapping parts. Um, so one of the kind of core, core driving goals for me, and I think for many in this community, is figuring out how to predict and control tissue states. So going beyond just thinking about what happens to individual cell types, individual cell lines, and considering um, the tissue as a whole. And it has a number of, um, kind of solving this problem is quite complex and it's useful to stratify it into distinct subtasks. And this first one being, uh, what are the conditions for inducing and maintaining cell types? And that has been a focus for much of my PhD, but uh, it has um, become, um, my sole focus um, only relatively recently, and this would be uh, the stuff that I will present closer to the end about how we are using, um, how we are formulating models of gene regulation to describe cell phenotypes. Um, then the second task for predicting and controlling tissue states is being able to map out tissue architecture. And this is what I will mostly talk about now. But I think for the future as a community, we need to think about um, how do we select optimal modalities and perturbation types to construct these tissue level models. Uh, it's not just kind of, uh, gathering lots of one data and being happy about it. You need to know kind of why do you need every part of the puzzle. And at the end, I will mention some thoughts on clarifying um, which kind of modalities we probably need for cell communication and tissue organization question. And a big driver for me is seeing the mechanisms of gene regulation and cell communication as a mechanism for organismal development. Um, and as a roadmap for cell engineering, rather than just kind of as a subject of study in itself. And I think that will permeate a bit in uh, the discussions we're going to have today. And um, yeah, so first thing I wanted to uh, talk about is um, the, a broad foundational principle that um, one of um, our colleagues in Teichmann Group, Statis Medias, recently the, um, brought to my attention. And this is that, um, uh, this can be a bit of a provocative statement, but the statement is that inductive biases help resolve no free lunch theorem. And um, the idea behind no free lunch theorem is that if you make more complex models with hopes of describing the data better, and those models only learn from data, they will describe the data, but they will have limited generalization. And in contrast, if you have uh, very simple models that learn generalizable, uh, that make generalizable predictions, they may not be as good as explaining data and therefore also not useful. Um, and kind of, kind of how physicists resolve that is by introducing prior knowledge as inductive biases. And that helps us build more complex models, but because they are more structured, they can generalize better. And uh, I will try to explain this with examples in, um, uh, kind of main part of the talk, um, but you can think of inductive biases on both model architecture, such as choosing information about how gene regulation works, that you need to represent communication from enhancer regions to the promoter region, uh, choosing to, to use that information to constrain um, model architecture itself versus 
uh, uh, inductive biases and model parameters. So I will give some examples of both uh, um, as they apply to salt location spatial mapping work. So kind of let's get straight into um, the TG architecture um, part. And in, in particular, let's think a bit about what TG architecture actually means, kind of what, what do we want to get out of um, computational methods in this area. And here I will reference um, this fantastic perspective uh, from um, Miri Adler, uh, Ruslan Medjidov, and a few others about how we can rethink tissue biology. And if normally, we take apart tissue into cell types and then um, attempt to visualize where they are. And this is a paradigm that we kind of uh, that we operated on when developing cell to location. That what we to analyze tissue architecture, we just want to see which cell types are where. And, but the paradigm change they propose is that we should also think not just about where individual cell types are, but we should think about um, how groups of cells relate to each other uh, in, in, and they systematize what are the types of relationships that can happen. For example, you can have uh, complementarity relations where um, one cell type like astrocytes can support the function of the primary cell type like neurons. Um, you can also have several cell types contribute into a certain function, uh, for example, as done in um, liver zonation, where uh, different zones, different hepatocyte zones, do different enzymatic reactions that together combine into a full metabolic function of the liver. Um, and it's useful to start thinking about not just where cell types are in the tissues, but how to disentangle these relations. But closer to the method, so I'm sure that many in this community uh, are familiar with the general idea, but I, I need to highlight some key points to um, uh, to help with explaining the methods and inductive bias, bias part later. Um, what we want to be able to do is to, uh, ideally, we would just generate single cell and single nucleus RNA-seq and multimodal data uh, with special coordinates. But at the moment, this uh, still looks technologically challenging. Um, so what is, what we can do in many projects is to take apart the tissue into single cell or single, nucle single nuclei, then use fa our favorite technologies on that side, uh, which now expanded from just doing single uh, doing profiling of RNA abundance to profiling both DNA accessibility and RNA abundance, as well as kind of other modalities. Um, and then from the same tissue, you profile special RNA abundance. Uh, this can be done with sequencing-based technologies like Visium, like um, SlideSeq, StereoSeq, and if there is now a much expanded portfolio of um, what we can use. Um, but both SlideSeq, both, uh, while the resolution of these technologies has been changing, as especially comparing first generation technology to Visium, to SlideSeq, to um, StereoSeq. We see increase in the resolution of individual, um, of, in, of uh, places on the tissues that are individually barcoded and capture RNA and then barcode that RNA with specially distinct barcodes. While we have increasing resolution of um, how detailed these are, uh, this still doesn't match to individual cells. And even for technologies that have subcellular resolution, such as um, StereoSeq, also OpenST from Nikolaus Rayovsky, um, also Visium HD, um, kind of a common way to analyze that data is to bin it in squares or in kind of whatever shape bins and analyze it similarly to Visium. And part of the reason is just convenience, but part of the reason is that individual locations that uh, in often detect very low counts. Um, and in when thinking about modeling these technologies, you always need to consider the details of the difference between them. And in a uh, case of Visium, one of the major points to always think about is that it's not single cell resolution and it mixes not just distinct cells, but it can also mix distinct um, tissue zones, such as blood vessel zone versus the functional B follicle zone and lymph nodes. 
Yeah, uh, so the method we developed uh, then is uh, aimed to integrate single nucleus data and uh, special transcriptomics data of this sort that we just discussed uh, to establish cell type location maps. And these cell type location maps can then be used as a um, starting point for um, looking at more interesting biology. And I will acknowledge people who contributed to this work, but in particular, I think from uh, the story of of what it took to develop it. Um, I would like to acknowledge our collaborators like Hamish and Ilo and Chen Shu who worked with me on, not necessarily on this method, but on um, application of it to different tissues and helped us um, optimize some parts of the model to realize that we need to do batch correction, not just apply it to individual samples and um, work through many practical aspects of uh, actually using it to study TG architecture. But yeah, also um, acknowledge Emma and two Artems for contributions to, um, to um, shaping the paper itself. And this was a collaboration between Omar Barakta group and Oliver Stegner. So yeah, um, given, we have a couple of problems to solve that come from technical issues of these technologies, including the higher resolution ones. Um, higher resolution ones, if you want to analyze them at such cellular resolution, uh, also add new, um, with new, new challenges in that you need to decide, if you aggregate them, you need to decide how. If you don't aggregate them, you need to do, um, you kind of don't really have enough information at individual locations to decide what's really there. And, but on top of that, you, we, you, the reason why we are doing these technologies is to study TG architecture. And to do that, we need these methods to map transcription with similar and rare cell types. Uh, we also need it to be sensitive for downstream applications. And I will mention some examples about it. Uh, and and if on top of this, when thinking about the reference, single cell reference side, you need to be able to deal with multiple batches and technologies. And finally, um, uh, rather than just publishing one model and forgetting about it, it's useful to, to think about a framework that helps um, incorporate future technologies and future questions. So the location is a hierarchical Bayesian count model. It um, describes observed counts in the special transcriptomics data um, using a negative binomial distribution and a um, negative binomial distribution with an explained um, batch and gene-specific variance component and the factorization of um, expected count. And the expected counts are factorized into a number of components that are each driven by things that we need to account for. And here I want to bring up that example of um, using inductive biases as either uh, different, as either drivers of choice of the architecture or choice of parameters. And given that what we need to know is abundances of cell types F uh, across special locations S, um, we need to construct the architecture, which is capable of um, estimating that abundance while mo from modeling observed special counts. So that's kind of the architecture part of it. Uh, but to in order to know that the latent factors you're finding correspond to cell types, you need to use average gene expression of, of those cell types, average RNA abundance per cell type per gene as a reference because otherwise you would just find some signatures. Like there have been a number of methods proposed that just factorize special data in some way. And if you don't use uh, the inductive bias of how gene expression profiles of individual cell types look, you can't really say that you are finding cell types in the data. Um, so here, this part comes in. So what we are saying is that um, special counts are, con an aggregate of a number of cell types according, weighted according to their abundances and weighted according to how much they express each of the genes. But our reference comes from different kinds of technology with different biases. So we need to account for technology sensitivity part. Um, so that would be the first part to deal with. 
Then the second part to deal with is actually that what we know about tissues is that cells in the tissues are not independently distributed. They tend to collocate. So we need to give the model the ability to learn which cell types tend to collocate. And we do that by introducing another layer of hierarchical priors that allows the model to learn similarity in cell type locations. And we also know that global covariance doesn't quite describe um, this. I will come back to it as an example at the end. But uh, uh, the main point is that um, we want to be able to learn which cell types are present in which areas of the tissue. And we thought that a reasonable way to address that would be by factorizing cell abundance in by specifying a hierarchical prior that learns factorization of cell abundance into a number of latent non-negative factors. And this looks like a, a very important feature for performance, as I will show later. And it was also the same idea was also used by uh, bias prism method. Um, and they show that it's similarly essential for improving performance. And one of the other things uh, that we included in the model is uh, the ability to specify expected number of cells at each location as a prior. Um, this, when the data quality is very good, this can help you get um, absolute cell abundance estimates. Um, however, we see that in vast majority of uh, special data sets in practice, you have quite a lot of uh, location-specific technical variability in RNA detection. Um, and if you um, have that technical problem, it becomes harder to distinguish um, high cell number from uh, technical reasons for high RNA detection. And we always need to normalize for this detection variability, but it differs a lot between data sets. And then finally, a problem which I think can still be improved on is how do you account for additive background? In isolated single cell data, you have free-floating RNA that stochastically floats into droplets with cells and then is profiled as if it was a RNA from that cell. However, here it doesn't stochastically float and there are special patterns in how this additive background distributes. Um, and but in the first instance, we just use the same models that you would use for a uh, um, stochastic uh, uniform distribution of background. And the way we implemented this model is uh, is using um, Pyro and the CVI tools. And we are using um, variational inference to estimate all of the parameters in the model. And in the first instance, it would be uh, in the first instance, all of the parameters are estimated directly, whereas one of the things that we attempted is improving scalability using amortized inference, where um, you can imagine um, using an encoder to produce cell abundance estimates, an encoder network, and this encoder network can be both fully connected that just sees the current location, or it can be a convolutional neural network. And in our experience, which is also aligned with uh, what DestVI uh, work shows, uh, it's extremely hard to get the same levels of accuracy with amortized inference approach. So there is something interesting going on about special sequencing technologies. And if either they are much lower sensitivity than single cell data where variational encoders are doing very well, or there are some issues with learning the function of how you map original special counts to cell abundant that makes amortizing this particularly hard. Yeah, hopefully this all makes sense. Um, so yeah, actually, uh, maybe we could take some questions about model architecture here because I will go, go to biological examples next and we would then have different kind of discussion topics to uh, talk about. Yeah, we can do that. I mean, if anyone wants to ask something, either chat or they can raise their hands. And... But it's uh, very cool up to now, um, the presentation, and you're going into detail, so I find it super nice. But maybe we should give also time. To... Ah, I see, I see, I see. Okay, so I'm reading out loud. Ah, no. It's... Uh... 
it's the notes sorry yeah. Yes, well, uh, let uh, if you have questions about this, uh, kind of uh, write them down, and uh, we can come back to it. So, one of the reasons to do comprehensive spatial mapping is to be able to use spatial regionalization as evidence for which subtypes are uh, both molecularly and spatially distinct. And I want to illustrate this aspect using a uh, noble um, regional astrocyte direction from our paper, but we are now applying it to a uh, kind of a, a number of uh, other TG context and hopefully it will become clear why it's a useful thing to do. So to do this, what um, we, the data we are starting with are sections from the mouse brain that um, contain hippocampus, but also contain cortex, uh, thalamus, hypothalamus, kind of a number of er distinct areas. And from each of um, the sections, we either isolated nuclei or profiled with special transcriptomics um, and then used um, methods that I just showed to uh, estimate cell type abundances across the brain um, jointly across uh, all of the sections we generated. Um, so one 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 important point that um, I mentioned in passing when describing normalization versus cell abundance difference, and um, if we look at histology images, uh, which are just uh, H and E images that uh, were um, dark blue color corresponds to uh, cells nuclei. If we look at if we look here, you would see that. Some areas of the brain, such as hippocampus, are much more cell dense than other areas. And if an area is more cell dense, it will have more RNA, and more RNA from that area will be profiled. So total RNA count in the special technologies is dependent on the biology of the tissue. And if you zoom in to higher resolutions, such as Visium HD or um, Stereoseq, you would also see that um, areas that are not nuclei, that are cell processes that correspond to um, cell processes or other parts of the tissues that don't contain cells, they would have very low counts. So the counts in this data are both biological and technical, and you need to use the regularizing priors on your technical part to allow the model to learn biological differences. So, so where is the comprehensiveness point coming from? I think that for this community, it's natural to take the entire atlas of the tissue to analyze it together, to then uh, think about specially mapping everything. But before special sequencing technologies, it was actually quite hard to um, map more than a few cell types at a time. The power of these technologies is really enabling of the analysis that I will show. What what we want to do here is we want to be able to specially map everything in the brain, all of the neuronal subtypes, and the telial cells, uh, microglia. Um, but specifically, we want to characterize regional heterogeneity in astrocyte population. So we want to keep the rest of the tissue at a certain reasonable granularity annotation that we have here. And we then want to specially map astrocytes at much higher resolution and use that to analyze the full extent of their regionalization. So to do that, um, we subclustered astrocytes to a um, very high degree. So, um, we also optimize the procedure for doing the subclustering to preserve as many biological differences as possible. Uh, for example, um, the differences between these clusters um, correspond to differences between sex of the mice. So we don't necessarily want, we found that uh, you can't necessarily correct that efficiently while preserving um, biological differences between regionalized subtypes. Uh, but maybe that was a limitation of how we did it. But anyway, um, the main point is that what you want to do is you want to produce highly granular cell clusters. Then you want to specially map the clusters of astrocytes plus everything else in the brain. So it's always it, you never um, map one cell type to these technologies. You always map 
one cell type, uh, you always kind of map uh, everything. So we are mapping subclustered astrocytes plus everything else. And by doing this iteratively, we were able to narrow down a list of 10 populations, which are both distinct specially and um, which are distinct both specially and transcriptomically. And I want to highlight uh, these two clusters that got grouped. The reason we grouped them is because we saw that their special distributions are similar. They, are loc they were located in the thalamic medial area. And um, similarly, we went through um, many of these examples and grouped other cell populations that were uh, transcriptionally similar. Um, so now we have a list of cell populations which are both distinct um, in um, their gene expression profiles, but are also distinct in their special mapping. And we don't necessarily know what this means functionally, uh, and we also don't necessarily know whether these differences are so intrinsic or uh, whether they are a response to local environment. For example, we found this habenular astrocyte population, which was represented by just 40 or so uh, nuclei in the data, and it precisely mapped to an area of the thalamus called habenula. Um, and it uh, all of these astrocyte subtypes had just a few tens of genes that differentiated them from each other. So let's say habenular population from hypothalamic um, um, astrocyte population. So it's quite possible that many of these states are a response to local neurons. And this comes to the reason why we want to do um, this analysis in the first place. So we want to be able to find which cell populations in the data are, what is the highest granularity cell population in the data that has distinct special locations. And then we want to be able to relate um, what happens to this population to its um, signaling exposure. But you wouldn't be able to do that if you just had um, low granularity annotations, for example, uh, if you just if you annotated astrocytes from um, deencephalic astrocytes from hypothalamus and thalamus or telencephalic astrocytes from um, cortex and um, basal ganglia, um, you need to have a workflow to identify these high granularity populations. Yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Um, so the reason why we want to map the high granular populations is to be able to analyze their the microenvironment surrounding them. And our first attempt at doing it um, can be illustrated with this lymph node example, where we took um, single cell sick reference of uh, lymph nodes, spleen, and tonsils. Um, in collaboration with Hamish King, where this trend of this reference was that it annotated multiple states of developing B cells, uh, of germinal center specific developing B cells, and germinal center specific developing T cells. And overall, the structure of the lymph node can be summarized like this that it has a zones in which T cells sit, it has zones in which naive B cells sit, and then when there is an infection, in, uh, you have a creation of germinal center zones in, um, um, uh, as you see highlighted here in blue. And these zones are organized by cells called follicular dendritic cells um, that kind of permanently sit in the tissue and then B cells and T cells come into the, t into the tissue, uh, migrate into the tissue from external sources. And what, what we did is we specially mapped um, um, this reference to this data and then used non-negative matrix factorization of um, cell abundance estimates to find distinct tissue compartments. And uh, I mentioned when describing the model that we have a hierarchical prior that, that allows the model to simultaneously map cell types and learn which cell types tend to collocate. So you can think of it as analyzing that part. We don't directly use the prior because it it's uh, it has more of an auxiliary function rather than an interpretation function. Um, 
we want to take sp um we want to take cell abundance and then analyze it using independent NMF because it gives you higher sensitivity. Whereas it's useful because there is a structure like this. So if we look at the germinal center, um, it has two smoothly varying zones. One is the dark zone, which is marked by um, presence of um, certain B cell subtype which undergoes recombination or, and mutagenesis stages that um, improve uh, the affinity, potentially improve the affinity of uh, B cell receptors. Um, and this is also a zone where B cells proliferate. And there is another zone uh, which is uh, which seems to be organized by um, follicular dendritic cells and where also specific subtype of T uh, helper cells reside. And Follicular dendritic cells and T helper cells together guide the development of um, B cells in this zone, guide the selection stage. Um, so by doing special mapping and then factorizing cell abundances, we can see this specially interlaced tissue zones. Um, and that was our first attempt at decomposing um, the environments around cells. And However, there could be ways to improve on it, and this is where um, what I want to discuss next. And so I also need to clarify that when you use Visium or when you aggregate high resolution special technologies in large bins, you always get this uh, problem of mul capturing multiple tissue compartments. And Naive analysis of the data would just attempt to do, Leiden, let's say, Leiden clustering or any other discrete clustering. And what we saw is that um, as hard as we tried to cluster locations, Visium locations, uh, we couldn't recover these two zones of the germinal center. Whereas if you factorize, you can. And I think this speaks to the fact that often we in the special realm, we need to think about more quantitative descriptions of tissue zones. But yeah, the future is trying to build the mechanistic models of cell interactions and also think about signaling effects on transcription. So let's think about it. Let's kind of discuss what is needed to make that happen. Um, and so let's kind of advance beyond uh, clustering special data to find tissue zones, and let's think about what do we what would we need to do to characterize how um, cells can influence each other and influence each other both in terms of change in cell state, such as activating transcription factors, but also influencing each other in terms of survival, proliferation, death, and. Here I want to lay out some foundational kind of statements about um, entities involved in cell communication and what is our evidence for them. Um, in particular, when we think about single cell atlases, um, we are looking at RNA abundance of receptors and signals in source cells, uh, in candidate source cells and candidate target cells. And for Target, cell, target cells can be sensing both uh, secreted molecules as well as receptors on the surfaces of other cells. And when we see the expression of these molecules in the data, it shows us that these cells can potentially interact, but it doesn't show you that, but it has many, but many things need to happen before that interaction actually happens. Um, both of these proteins need to be translated and with some technologies such as SiteSeq or in situ protein imaging, you can directly measure what was translated. But for now, um, and all, I mean, while single cell proteomics is a bit more advanced now than it was a couple of years ago, um, we still don't have the ability to profile uh, everything. And you you would you need to select you need to select kind of proteins in advance that you already want to look at. And in addition, if you just see uh, if you just see translation of secreted molecules, it doesn't necessarily mean that the cells are actually secreting them, because secreting can be timed, such as uh, in case of hormones. Um, insulin isn't always secreted; it's secreted in bursts in response to um, 
in response to signals from in kind of in response to cell's environment. And in principle, we may be able to image that, but it's quite hard to set up and we don't have the technologies to do that systematically at the moment. The second thing that we need to look at for communication problem is information about signal receptor affinity. And this can be determined using completely different uh, protein binding experiments. And here is again when we come to the difference between using inductive biases as uh, choices about architecture versus in specific information versus kind of choices of parameters. So in this case, we could use um, experimentally determined um, affinities. Uh, maybe in most cases, we don't actually have the affinity. We just have um, binary binding uh, information um, such as annotated in many databases like cell phone DB or uh, profiled in specific experiments that didn't really do high resolution dose dependence to determine affinities. But this can still give us important information. And in many cases, it can tell us that, well, at least we know that BMP receptor family senses uh, BMP signal family. So we need to take the evidence about expression and signal secretion, and we need to take evidence about uh, receptors and signals, and we need to start putting it together. And the first, the first thing to put together is uh, to estimate signal concentrations around target cells. The, while when you, we are talking about direct cell-to-cell -cell contacts, it's easier to see that they are contacting, especially with high resolution partial transcriptomics. Uh, with signals, they can be secreted at a large distance, and we need to guess that somehow. And I will show you some results on how we think this can be done from special transcriptomics. And finally, we need to put these two th uh, things together to produce receptor occupancies. Um, so in particular, you uh, we can stratify this into two kinds of interactions. First would be to combine affinity with abundance of cellular receptors, and then you make a prediction of kind of an adhesive contact. Um, and then you have a different model for um, receptor occupancy by secreted signals. But in principle, you can think of it in similar ways and uh, in like the first pass model, it can be done in some, identically. And then once in the model, we computed these values, we can compute um, the effects of um, occupied receptors, both receptors occupied by secreted stuff and by stuff on other cells. Uh, we can model the effects of these molecules on induction of new states, on different modes of survival, uh, on different modes of migration, and finally on kind of restructuring of the tissue architecture itself. And the point about the tissue architecture as separate from the points above is that you can think about the points above as stuff that happens to individual cells, whereas tissue architecture is kind of higher order uh, organization property. Sorry for interrupting. Can we see something like five minutes more so we can have at least 10 minutes for questions as well? I think that it's super interesting and people will ask things. Or Yeah, yeah. it's getting uh, very close to okay, the end of it. Um, and in particular, for inducing new states, uh, we want to get to a picture uh, like this where we know we can observe the progenitors, we can observe differentiated cells, and we can observe to what kinds of signals distinct kinds of differentiated cells are exposed to. And we want to build up toward that model. But at the moment, what I think we can realistically do with special transcriptomics data is observe receptor abundance for candidate target cells, and then signal abundance, uh, where the signal can be both a surface receptor and secreted protein um, around target cells. And uh, I'm implemented the new modules in the salt location package to help provide this for um it's very easy to uh, mm -hmm. look at um distance function profiles at single cell resolution you can just plot distance from a uh, cell of interest or uh, a cell type of interest to um other signals or to, to um 
other cells. But the question is how to do that for Visium. And we put a lot of work into figuring this out. And um, we, can, we now have a new PR that includes that information. Uh, and with this, what you can do is you can look at distance bins away from certain cell population of interest and see which ligands are enriched at which distance scales. And we also see that this is reproducible between different kinds of technologies. So fresh frozen Visium versus Visium FFP. So yeah, hopefully today I showed you a new perspective on um, our special mapping work. Uh, and gave you more examples of how you can use single cell spatial integration to um, map cell types with the goal of annotating um, which differences arise in association with special architecture. I don't want to say caused by special architecture. Uh, we want to be careful around that because for the ca causation part, this is what we want to to address in the future work. And in the future, uh, and in my current work actually focuses on how you build a model of gene regulation that describes differences between cell types uh, using single cell transcriptomics, atlases, but also special information uh, across um, human and mouse organogenesis. Um, and yeah, hopefully in the future iterations of this meeting, I will be able to share some of our modeling results with you. Perfect, thank you so much. It was uh, great and a uh, lot of information, I think. So it's good that we have uh, at least 15 minutes for questions. Uh, please raise hand or write on chat and I can read the questions out loud and then Vitaly can answer. I have lots of questions because I'm actually using uh, cell to location. And I find it super nice, but I won't. I will. I will start yeah. with. Uh, yeah, I will start with the, the chat and then I can answer. Mm. Uh, so, in constructing the single nucleus RNA seq reference, which of the following is recommended? One, pull all cells from all samples together, then train each tissue slides within the same ref with the same reference or using matching sample to create a reference for each sample that train, then train its tissue slide with the, its corresponding reference. Let me uh, come back to the slide that would help kind of discuss stuff. Um, It's a very good point. Uh, also, uh, it's a. Uh, I would say that this is a very practical question. And the question is, what are the practical reasons to pick one option over another? Um, in this case, um, we had consecutive sections from the same bra mouse brain. And in this context, but each of the sections had relatively small cell number. Um, it was about um, eight, eight to 10,000 per uh, section. So for practical reasons, it made sense to, um, and also, uh, yeah, we'll come back to the biological side later, but for practical reasons, it makes sense, it made sense to aggregate the reference, cluster this reference together, uh, especially for getting the astrocyte subtypes. So this population of habanular astrocytes had 40 cells across six samples, but it would have only like five in one, three in another, four in the third one. So if you want to capture high granularity cell states, I think you have to go after integrated references that contain everything. Um, and overall, I think this is where the vector should be. It should be towards creating models that can take in, that can ingest the reference, single cell reference of the entire tissue and then map to many special samples. However, when it starts to practically make sense to separate samples is when there are major differences between um, tissues. So for example, if instead of uh, having consecutive sections across very similar mouse brain areas, if you were comparing tumors from different fashions, tumors that have different copy number variation properties, uh, you would either have to create a single model uh, for both single cell reference side and special side that can account for the same copy number differences in both um, and for the same donor effects differences in both, or you have to um, 
analyze special data and single cell data uh, of patient by patient. So that would be a kind of a practical reason to um, separate the references at the moment. But overall, I would say in, uh, in pretty much all projects that I worked on, on mapping out normal tissues, it was more beneficial to leverage higher cell counts to find greater granularity of cell populations than to um, kind of get at very perfect uh, section by section matching, but there would be examples like that cancer case where um, you have to deal with many changes, coordinated changes in both special and single cell data sets and correct them simultaneously. Perfect. Uh, you can follow up on the chat if you want great things. So you will cover mm -hmm. everything. Uh, yeah, so can I ask something super practical because I'm actually using it and I have a question. Um, so in case you don't have the tissue image to lay over the UMAP or the results in a way that comes from the cell to location on top of the tissue image, how would you visualize the, the outcome? I, I saw that you showed this uh, dot plot that shows from, from latent clustering, I guess, or for regions, uh, the cells that you end up with. But you know, mm -hmm. the image actually gives a very nice uh, overview when you actually have the tissue. And I was wondering if there is anything. I Do you mean the cases where you have special transcriptomics, but you don't have any orthogonal tissue image? Yes, exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think that's uh, this is what happens with, with um, slide seek and also with stereo seek, as far as I understand. Um, it does make it a lot harder to analyze um, here we could compare where cell types map. Uh, actually, let let this cartoon run. We could compare where cell types map mm -hmm. with anatomical area. Uh, whereas if you don't have the anatomical area, it is indeed harder to know uh, where you should expect things. Uh, you would probably rely on similar landmark cell types as in this cartoon. Um, so, as in this kind of illustration plot. Uh, that you know that some highly distinctive populations are present in these highly distinctive areas and then relate them to each other that way. So you, if you see astrocytes in the same area as this green thalamic excitatory neuron population, then you would guess that, well, these astrocytes are in the same thalamic area. So you probably have to use landmark cell types mm -hmm. to do it. Um, it, it, in many projects, we found it, it to be extremely beneficial to have histology images because you can use uh, anatomy-derived annotations to help with the analysis as well, so not rely on um, this approach of, um, the, of either clustering by NMF or clustering by uh, discrete clustering methods, but to actually just rely on... Uh, we know that this location overlaps with um, lymphoid structure in the lung. So we can ask which cell types are there. Um, and I think that um, leverage, yeah, it's, we should try to aim for having this orthogonal high resolution um, images. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. I'm just using a different technology, a very new one. So it mm. sounds very pretty there. But yeah. Yeah, I guess this is a trade-off of uh, getting to um, deeper resolution versus um, having external reference to uh, to contrast observations. No. Yeah, I, I have no question. Are there any questions from the chat before I, or from the, from the attendees? Anyone? You can even just open the mic and to talk. Yeah, I I have the question of um. So you talked about in the especially in the in the future plans about cell cell communication, and I think I might have missed it. I might have misunderstood something. So you are planning to use it as a prior knowledge, right? Knowing kind of what to expect from cell cell communication, so you can predict the cells per region or per spot, or right. So what can be used as prior knowledge are uh, the re signal receptor affinities, but what you do, and uh, yeah, I skipped this slide a bit. Um, so if you have single cell data without special data, 
you see you have the prior knowledge of signal receptor affinities or just binary information of what binds what and you have observations of signal RNA abundance but you don't know any of these intermediate steps and this special data uh, this single cell uh, this sorry this special transcriptomics data you similarly don't get many of these intermediate steps what you get um are the distance functions between cells that have receptors and cells that have signals so what we need to do is uh, to we need to build models that predict um, protein abundances around cells that have receptors from the distribution of signals and then build another layer of models that um, use predicted occupancy to model this either cell level or tissue level phenotypes. Hopefully that makes sense. So mm -hmm. the differences in what is the prior knowledge that we can directly use and mm -hmm. the prior knowledge on which signal receptor pairs influence which transcription factors or influence survival directly or influence um, proliferation induction kind of switch from G0 to G1 cell cycle stage or which ligand receptor pairs influence cell death. And the annotations there are quite sporadic and it's a bit unclear how generalizable they are to uh, mm -hmm. cell atlases as opposed to cell lines from which they were initially derived. Yeah, yeah, I see. Good. I see people leaving. I want to ask one more thing before you go. It's not about cell location. So now you are hired as, so you keep working on it, right? You are hired as researcher after your PhD for mainly on this type of topic, right? So yep. yeah, anyone can reach out to you through Zulip or emails or Twitter because we have given everything and yeah. keep good. That's good. Great. Uh, we're going to upload the YouTube. Thank you so much for the talk. I mean, we, I think we could, could have done it in two sessions or I don't know. Two, it has too much information, which is super interesting. Thanks, everyone, for attending and reach out to Vitaly if you want anything. See you in the next community meeting in two weeks. Thank you very much. And thanks for keeping up this great initiative. And it would be really nice to see the more open communication between people who um, develop methods who use these methods to study the biology and yeah i'm looking forward to the future that brings thank you see you bye bye